Hey, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, glad you could join us today on the Cam and Otis show. Uh, today we're going to talk a bit about uh, our man Shackleton, uh, you know, and his expedition to attempt to traverse, be the first first man, human to team, whatever, to traverse across the Antarctic, and how, what happened. What occurred uh, to him and his expedition team, and and the leadership lessons that came from that, and it's a it's an unbelievable story. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, and what happens during this two plus year event, if you will, and you think about the time and the technology that these men uh, survived through and the weather and the environment they survived in uh it, it's quite an amazing story and and generally speaking and those of us looking back on it and analyzing it contribute to uh, the the survival of his team to shackleton ernest shackleton's leadership ability and uh, i know camden you got you've got some uh You've got a bit of the background of the story to kind of, for folks who haven't read it, and there's two books, there's uh, one called The Endurance and one that's just called South that was written by uh, Sir Ernest Shackleton himself. Highly recommend you pick those up and uh, read them. So, yes, Cam, sir. Here's a little bit of that background on the story, please. All right. So uh, for those of y'all who don't know and uh, couldn't guess by his name, Ernest Shackleton was a British explorer believe it or not. Um, and so he was, he was a British explorer focused mainly in the Antarctic during uh, what was known as the Age of Heroes. And we'll talk some about that uh, later on in the podcast. Uh, but his, his first record-breaking moment was with, with, as a member of the crew of the Nimrod, they got the closest at that time that anyone has ever been to the South Pole. They were uh, less than 100 miles away from the South Pole, furthest anyone had made it at that time. Then after that, they went back a few years later. He threw together another expedition, and they were I know, literally racing uh, an Austrian team, if I remember right. That, right. Uh, so it was the Brits versus the Austrians, and they were racing to the South Pole there at the same time, and it was this big, big, big political event. And uh, they lost, unfortunately. If I remember right, the Austrians used uh, dog sled teams, and Ernest Shackleton tried to use uh, actual sleds with motors, and the fuel was too heavy, and they lost. Um, so then after he lost the race to the South pole, he set his eyes on the transarctic expedition that you mentioned. So that is just going from sea to sea across Antarctica, uh, basically longest point to longest point that hadn't been done yet. And, uh, definitely hadn't been done with dog sled teams like they were going to do. So they left, uh, early of, or started putting the team together in 1912, 1913, started laying out the plans and, uh, doing a lot of the fundraising. And we'll pause at lots of different moments throughout the story because there's just so many leadership moments and so much great insight you can get from Shackleton um, and talking about him funding the expedition. So this was his, would have been after two consecutive failures, he was trying to finance this mission and he could not get any money for it. So what he did was, this is right when uh, cameras and movies were starting to come around, right? So he sold all of the photography rights and all of the video production rights off for thousands and thousands of dollars to finance his mission before they even left. And so he wound up bringing a very highly skilled photographer. So like, I know the book I have, I'm not sure if South has this, but the endurance has all these amazing pictures that he was taking throughout the entire expedition. And it just adds to it. And, but he had the foresight to, to see that ahead of time and to fi make a smart financial choice off that, which, you know, just one of the many things he did that was amazing. Well, and think about, uh, think about film and photography in that day and age too. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not gambling. talking about uh, your, your smartphone. We're talking about a big hunk of steel, mm -hmm. baby aluminum, cast aluminum and the weight of the film. And it, it just, yeah, it, it's, oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, and, and it's in your pocket to, to jump ahead a little bit, you know, when they, uh, when they go through, there's a moment of the story where they're going through and each, each man is only allowed so much weight because they can only take so much weight as they're journeying across the ice because they know the dogs can pull that weight with this amount of food and yada, 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 and that they can continue their expedition at that rate. 
Um, and the photographer had to throw all of his camera equipment into the ocean. And I don't know exactly, but he basically took his 50 best, uh, 50 best, uh, what's the name? Negatives. Is that the right word? Uh, cartridges of film usually or right. the negatives. Yeah. Right. So he took his 50 best pictures basically. And those are the ones that are in the book is the ones he took home that he carried with him the rest of the trip. Um, but I'll go back, go back to the story. So basically they're sailing in and, uh, they get down there a little bit late. Uh, the, they get down there a little bit late. They wind up getting stuck in an ice sheet. And this is significant because the ice around Antarctica churns around and can be very, very catastrophic. There's a, there's a quote in, from Shackleton's journal, which is uh, what the ice gets, it keeps. And, you know, spoiler alert, that's what happens uh, to the endurance. They get stuck in the ice. They try to wait out the winter, hoping that it would thaw enough that they'd be able to get out of it. And uh, about few months left in the winter i think uh the whole ship breaks down and they wind up getting completely lifted out of the water by two sheets of ice combining together and it rips up the bottom of the ship this old wooden ship and they tear it up and they wind up breaking down the ship getting everything they could moving off of it and then living on this sheet of ice for months waiting for winter to end then they break down the ship any wood they could salvage make it into sleds to continue going south uh, then at that point, I think it's when they realize that that's a terrible idea and he goes towards survival instead of the accomplishment of the mission, which is again, a great leadership point right there. If you want to talk about that a little bit. Well, yeah. But I just wanted to, you know, the ice sheets you touched on it, they, they're not stationary. They're in constant movement. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's one of the things, you know, when you hear about icebreakers and, and things like that and, and what happened to, uh, the ship, the endurance, that that's what happened is these sheets of ice move and they're constantly shifting. They're, I mean, it's just like a glacier does, right? Everybody mm -hmm. knows that glaciers have a flow. It's not a stationary hunk of ice and snow. And that, that's what the Arctic and Antarctic sheets of ice do is they're in constant motion moving. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what causes the destruction. It's not, it's not like going out to your neighborhood pond that freezes over and there's a there's a piece of wood that was floating in it that freezes and gets stuck. It's it's nothing like that. It's mm -hmm. a much larger, larger scale. Right. And uh, the, the, they talk a lot about that, the power behind it during the time where they're on the ship before they evacuate it. And they talk about the, the noise of the ice wrecking the ship beneath them and they can't do anything about it. And they, they go through, I think, two or three different false evacuations where they, you know, grab everything and get off the ship and then it doesn't break. So they get back on because it was the only shelter they have. Um, so then from there, I mentioned, I touched on this earlier, they go and they have to, he makes each man go and they only got, you know, uh, two pounds that they could carry with them. So these are guys throwing gold pocket watches and everything out into the ocean, or actually they left them on the ice in the hopes that they could come back. I do remember they said that, yeah. um, but they basically, each of them took their most prized possession. So some of them, it was that gold pocket watch and a gold pocket watch and a journal that's pretty much what each one of them took and which is why another reason why the story is so interesting is you have so many journal experts excerpts from all these different guys um i think that's a great pausing moment right there to talk about the leadership one to have the skill and knowledge to be able to know like hey each guy gets a pound and a half of his own personal items that he can take with us on the sleds and that's it um and then the, the leadership to have that happen and you don't get don't get the crap me now you to be frank i mean <laughs> yeah so i mean let's think about that how did he do that it wasn't it wasn't just in that moment that he created that mm -hmm. and what he create what he was working off of is the trust the men the men on the expedition the men in the team had the utmost trust in their leadership mm -hmm. and knew that what he said was in the best interest of their survival and their success their success initially, and then their survival eventually, and they trusted him in those decisions, 100%. And how he developed that trust was, it goes all the way back to the selection process of, mm -hmm. of how he picked the team, right? It's, it's no different than how you pick your team for your business as you grow your business and how you build your team in that same thing. He went through a process of requirements and skill sets and experience mm -hmm and interviews with each of these men that he selected into his team 
and then trained them and put them together. And they were, I mean, what was it? Uh, 20, 28 men, something like that. 28. That sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. 28, uh, 28 men. So think about that locked up together in a, in a vessel, uh, and you know, what, three, four months to get from England down, just down to Antarctica to even start. Mm -hmm. Uh, think about those confined spaces and, and, you know, they're not playing candy crush on their phones. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. I think, uh, you know, I, I'd love to dive a little bit more into that. The selection and the grouping of the party members, like you said, there's 28 guys that he was working with and, uh, I'm going to call this 50, 50. I'm not sure exactly what the split was, but roughly half of those guys were engineers, worked with their hands, ship workers, those type of things. And the other half were full blown scientists. So they had half the jocks, half the nerds on the boat, and he was able to keep them from killing each other for this entire expedition. I think, and you know, there's there's smaller personality tweaks in between. But even just looking at the the you know the uh, the blue collar white collar difference that you get uh, at the very beginning of it, and how he handles that, and that kind of sets the precedent moving forward that you know we're all equal on this. You know, y'all might sleep on the deck below us, but they're still equal and they still go through all of that together and they work as a team. You know, uh, you, you talk about this in your book. There's a little plug for uh, enable your team success. But uh, <laughs> you talk about you can't be scared to get your hands dirty, right? And Shackleton made sure that even though, you know, he talks about in the book plenty, the, a lot of those scientists weren't very tough guys, but they were, they were in it. They were, they were bought in 100% and they were in it till the end. And they worked, they worked their asses off just as much as the engineers and the shipwrights did. So they believed in the mission, right? That exactly. You know, when we go back to talk about uh, the business and, and selecting your team and building your team and, and how you create that successful team. It's the fact that they believe the members of the team believe in the mission, and, you know, and you can relate this back to my time in special forces. You know, we believed in the mission that we were, assigned to perform and that was how we created the success and now how, how we survived in the situations that we were in and and then even today and the guy what the guys are doing in iraq afghanistan and around the world and that's what shackleton did with these guys he's hand selected them he was i mean there there's some definite uh talent and skill sets there that he developed over the years in his previous expeditions Mm -hmm. knew what he was looking for. So he was able to evaluate each of those team members to create, to create that team of 28. And, and, uh, you know, uh, and I'll, I'll just say, you know, like I was talking about last week with the, with the rugby team, the U S men's national team, when I was working with them, it's about creating the flow and, and operating as an organism. Mm -hmm. And not as a bunch of individuals, even in, even in smaller groups of individuals, still not success. It's, a, it's about operating as an entire organization together to create that flow. And that's what Shackleton did here with this selection process. It begins with the mission set that he created and the vision he had, and then selecting men that bought into that same vision, bought mm -hmm. into his, him as a leader and the vision that he had and included them in joining them. Yes, sir. And, you know, that's, you're 100% you're right. That's what led them to be able to accomplish all these tremendous feats. So um, I won't go through the exact details because they're amazing and I don't remember all of them. You know, this is, this is the biggest page turner about guys stuck on an ice sheet that you will ever freaking read. I can tell you that much. <laughs> it was a fast. There we are. All right, give okay. it. Uh, let's give it just a few. You got me now. Here. Yep, I got you yep. now. You were that was at fourteen minutes and fourteen seconds. So let's go to fifteen thirty. Restart with that same line, please. 
I'll point at you. You're at 1510 now. Do you remember where? Okay. Uh, which line was that? I said they sank yet? No. Okay. So 10 seconds. Should I just do the whole thing again then? Yeah, I'll just do the whole thing. Okay, so going back to the story here. So uh, the boat, the Endurance gets stuck in this ice sheet and they're slowly drifting away from Antarctica, getting further and further away from their goal as they're stuck. Because it was too uh, too chaotic there and the, there was too much breaking ice. They would have could have very easily slipped in the ocean overnight while they were sleeping. So they move off the ice sheet and find a more stable area. About a month later, the endurance sinks after, you know, after being crushed by the ice. Then uh, a few months after that, they take the, uh, take the sleds that they had built out of the endurance, break them down and build them into boats, and then sail the boats off into Elephant Island, which was uh, about, I got the notes right here, about 100 miles off, off from the ice sheet. So in they the, get there. In the Antarctic Ocean. We're we're yes. not talking. We're not in the Caribbean. We're not in the Gulf of Mexico. We're in the Antarctic Ocean. And if you've if you've never seen video of the water down there, it is. Uh, I've never personally experienced it, but I've seen seen plenty of episodes and and videos of various mm -hmm. documentaries. And that water down there is unbelievable. Chalky and, doesn't even begin to describe it. Yeah, and cold. <laughs> Yeah. You know, that water is like constantly in below 35 degrees. Mm -hmm. It's probably closer to 30 degrees most of oh, the yeah. time. And uh, so, yeah, the, so they sail 100 miles in that and they get to this uh, to the bay of Elephant Island. And so to kind of paint the picture a little bit, this is also April in the Southern Hemisphere at this point. So it's getting freaking cold too, even, even for Antarctica. And it is... At this point, you have guys getting frostbite. Guys are literally frozen because the water, uh, you get, you can't, you're sailing on homemade boats that you threw together over the course of a few weeks out of sleds. You're not able to really do anything to combat the waves. And so they're all soaked to the bone and frozen. And they talk about literally being like, if you stopped rowing, you would freeze solid because your clothes would all freeze that fast. So uh, I don't remember exactly how long it took them. I want to say took them about a week week or two to get to that island somewhere along those lines and they set up there and they build camp and Shackleton starts looking at it and basically realizes that there's no hope for them ever to get rescued on this little island in the middle in the middle of the Antarctic Ocean or Antarctic Sea Ooh, the Scotia Sea see that's why I have notes out in front of me and the Scotia Sea mm -hmm. and this uh and this island wasn't even it wasn't a whaling island or a fishing island it was just an island there was nothing built on it so they take their boats and use all but one of them to build a shack, put all the guys in there. They hunt penguins and eat penguins and any fish they can catch. And uh, after a little bit of time, Shackleton realizes that this isn't going to work, that they can't do this forever, and that the men are going to go crazy. And so he picks uh, three men to go with him, and they set course for uh, another island, which is uh, South Georgia Island. Mm -hmm. And South Georgia Island was a whaling island that operates year round. So they knew that they would be able to find people there. One of the fundamental problems is they're on the west side of South Georgia Island. And the bay, the port where they could get into is on the east side. So they wind up sailing across. He picks three men to go with him. They go through this uh, 460 mile journey, something like something insane like that. Uh, I doesn't have it in the notes right here, but it's over, over 300, 400 mile journey with the four of them in a freaking rowboat across the Antarctic Ocean in the dead of winter. And they get there and they, uh, and they crash on the far side of the island and then have to hike through the snowy mountains. Uh, they talk about going through 10 foot snow drifts to get across the other side. I want to stop there for a second before we talk about the aftermath of once they get to that whaling village. And I wanted uh, for you to kind of touch on the selection. And uh, I, I should have gotten the guy's name out in front of me, but we probably shouldn't talk too bad about him. He's been dead for a long time. But uh, there's an engineer in the group. And this engineer is the one thorn in Shackleton's side the entire time. From the moment they leave Argentina to the point where they get back to Britain. He is a thorn in his side. Right? And so can you kind of dive in on, on that so get into the selection part there? Well, you know, 
that's not a bad thing, right? I mean, if, if you had, if you have a team uh, full of yes men, then who's, who's checking you? So, yeah, I mean, it, it may be, It may be one of those things where you just have to deal with it. It may be frustrating, but you know what? If somebody is, is checking you, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's probably a good thing, you know, because to have, to have a bunch of people that are just standing around and go, oh, yeah, great idea, great idea, great idea. Well, who's checking to make sure it's right? And, and yeah, it can be frustrating because uh, I've all, you know, if you've, you've led organizations long enough, you will, you will run across people that are against everything you said. Mm -hmm. And that's what this guy was, but he was also, but he also fell in line. Right. And, and he would I, say, no, no, no. And Mr. Nate, it'll, this won't work. This is stupid. But you know what? When Shacklin had said, no, nope, that's it. All right. We're going this way. Mm -hmm. He would shut up and shovel. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. There, there, was, there was a moment where they were, uh, when they're trekking across the ice while they're still stuck on that ice sheet. And uh, they're in a, you know, they got their sled line going through across the ice. And he's back there and he's just jabbering, jabbering. Why the hell are we doing this? Shackleton doesn't know anything. We're all going to die. Da, 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 da. And he's just going, going, going. And Shackleton, who you'll, you'll learn throughout this book, I, I think this is the only time he ever probably yelled it anyone mm -hmm. and he sets down his sled and marches all the way back down there and basically shut the hell up quit your bitch and get back in line guess what he did he shut up quit his bitch and got back in line because he didn't want to die and he believed shackleton on that and that's you know you can talk about that a little bit uh the the being able to control yourself uh if you're if you're a yeller all the time your yelling doesn't do that much but if you're a really quiet coach you're a really quiet leader and then you yell oh my gosh people will listen to you <laughs> yeah well i mean it, it's it's all about the style i mean if you're a if you're a yeller and screamer all the time then what do you do in a crisis situation mm -hmm. that's right? a great way of putting it you know it, it's it's a learn it becomes a learned beha behavior for your team so if you yell and scream throw a fit uh throw you know yell names call people stupid idiots whatever all all the time and then when something bad happens, whether, whether we're talking sports team, business, whatever, and something bad happens, how are you going to express that? Are you going to express mm -hmm. that the opposite direction by talking in a nice, calm, monotone voice? And what do you think is going to happen then? And, and also in the same respect, I would also say if you're a yellow or a yeller and a screamer sort of a leader, then your team becomes callous to that. And they also, you, you are also becoming a leader of fear, right? Lead by fear as opposed to leading through trust and, and knowledge and, and caring for your team. And that's what, that's what Shackleton did. You know, he, he, he cared for these men. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this wasn't a self preservation thing because he could have easily taken a couple of guys and said, all right, you guys stay here. We'll be back. Mm -hmm. And he easily survived and easily made it out with just a handful of the strongest men and not cared about the rest. But he cared deeply about each and every one of those guys. Right. And they cared deeply about him, and that's how they were all able to survive. Mm -hmm. And uh, so going back to kind of the group selection and talking about that final trip or second, the uh, penultimate trip, I guess, uh, compared to going back for them, uh, he, he took the engineer with him because he knew that – he was going to be a thorn in his first mate side and that there was likely a chance that there would be mutiny because like we talked about, everyone's bought in on Shackleton. That's not a question, but if Shackleton's not there, all of a sudden this engineer gets a little bit more clout and a little bit more people start listening to him. And that's the, that's the problem he foresaw. And so he took him on that final journey with him, even though he was probably the last person on the freaking planet uh, besides one of his many ex-wives. There's a, little history <laughs> but uh that he wanted in that boat with him and but he took him with him anyway because he knew it was the smartest thing for the team you know it's kind of the uh keep your friends close and your enemies closer type thing well it's 
it's it's that, but it's that to a different degree. I would say mm-hmm. it's it's truly knowing everybody on your team and and what what makes them tick. What's their skills? What's their weaknesses? What what how can you get the most out of those people? And and knowing those things, I you know it, it is is what successful leaders know and, and can imply uh, apply to how they move forward and, and that's that's what Shackleton was able to do in in some of the most uh, terrible terrible situations uh, that you could ever come up with mm. uh, he managed that situation and you know we don't have true insight into you know did he sit back and and how did he how did he analyze it how much discussion mm-hmm. did he have amongst his uh amongst his leadership team or was it okay this is what we're going to do i mean i i believe he you know just knowing what kind of leader he was he probably he probably talked to people all the time mm-hmm. uh involved his leadership team in 99.9% of all the decisions because if you have that leadership team involved in the decisions, then they are they they get buy-in, right? Yep. By participation, as opposed to again going back to that that leadership style of just telling people what to do. Mm-hmm. That is, you know, that only works for just a short period of time. You can get away with it, and in crisis situations, but to truly have a team that is successful and truly have a team that is in the flow, you've got to have that, that trust. You've got to have that inclusion with your team and and get their buy-in and everything you do. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, one thing I think I want to shift it over this way because I want to make sure we talk about this uh, because I think it's one of the most interesting aspects of the story Um, and make sure we don't run over the time a little bit too much on this is the aftermath of the whole situation. So I mentioned he gets to uh, he gets to South Georgia Island and he then has to go through this long process of trying to get whalers to go and rescue uh, re- rescue his men. So he gets a whaling ship after months of trying to, you know, bribe people. Uh, I think he, I think he winds up getting a loan basically wired from England and able to say, look, like I will pay you for this ship, but you, we need to go rescue my men now. And they get out there. And uh, at this point it's already hitting winter again and the island is frozen in, in an ice pack and they're able to get, uh, I want to say, so I think the first time they go, they're able to get about 30 miles in and then he goes back and they get an Argentinian uh, icebreaker. And they go in and they get, I think, about 20 miles offshore to the point where they can see this island and he can, you know, not see them in probably, but they can see that they're an island, there's an island there and they can't get into it. And this takes uh, pretty much a full year for him to be able to get back to that island and be able to rescue his men. And during this time, you can really see the passion he had uh, for his men and the conviction he had in the mission because he, he, go, he completely goes to shambles. And it's, it's terribly sad because it's such a happy ending to such a terrifying story. But when you, when you read about what happens to him afterwards, he, he goes from a guy who barely ever had a whiskey to a full blown alcoholic in that one year span, because he is drinking himself to death watching because he's just sure that his men are dying on there. And it's, it's terrible, but it shows, it shows the passion he had for all of those men that he was working with. Yeah, that, that's a powerful uh, point to make too, and and how much he cared deeply, deeply cared for those men, his team, and you know, I think I think there's a lesson learned in that also, in the fact of the acceptance of you've done all you can do, mm-hmm. and you have to draw that point, right? How much was- how much are you willing to accept and and take the burden of that guilt? Uh, and it wasn't a, in the sense of a, a true survivor's guilt, mm-hmm. but it was a guilt that he, you know, he had no idea where they, were they all dead? Uh, you know, had he, had he made a mistake? So he was, he was, what he did, what happened was he, be, he started to doubt, yep. he started to doubt his decisions. And as a leader, when you start to doubt your decisions, your, your confidence goes down and your guilt goes up. And, mm-hmm. you start- and I, I can, 
I could infer a lot for, you know, kind of like you're touching on the way, you know, he started doubting himself and uh, being that kind of self-critical, you know, I could have done more. You can get, you can pick that up in the tone, a lot of his writings and things of like, he, he could, if he had, a, if he, oh, I'm trying to, oh, I should have reread this right beforehand. Cause I know there's a piece, they make a few decisions that mm -hmm. you could say led them to getting stuck in the ice pack in the first place. You know, they were a week leaving or some week late leaving. And yeah. that type of little, and that's what happens is that eats away at him. And he, he doesn't accept that th that's in the past and he can no longer control it. He lets it eat away at him over and over. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a, it's, it's a great leadership trait to a point, mm -hmm. but when you, when you waller in it, one of the things that, one of the ways I like to describe it is when you waller in that point, as opposed to accepting that it happened that way. And how can I improve off of that? And how can I do better when you go back and you continue to waller in the past of a decision that you made, that guilt comes up and you, what if yourself to death and you never, you, you stop looking and envisioning the future mm -hmm. and you worry more about what ha has happened that you can no longer control or change. And that's a bad place for a leader to be. And that's, that's why he got to that point mm -hmm. where he, he just, he just lost it. He, he, he drowned himself in alcohol and eventually died of alcoholism because of the guilt that he felt the, the failure that he felt for not accomplishing what he wanted mm -hmm. to accomplish and the guilt that he felt for those early decisions that he felt destroyed the opportunity to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I'd like to go a little bit further into the aftermath of once I actually get back to Britain. And uh, for those of y'all who don't have your history books out, uh, that, that year 1914 when they left, that's a little bit significant, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So uh, what is it? They're, they're not even down in Argentina yet at this point when World War I starts. And they wind, they wind up uh, radioing back to Britain and saying, Can, uh, do you need us to turn around? You know, we're ready to fight if we need to. And they say, no, our country needs you to go accomplish this feat. Mm -hmm. So the country was behind them. And, you know, me, as they're gone, uh, that, that three years, Europe, of course, you know, descends into the chaos of World War I. And they come back and, you know, talk about these guys and their sense of servitude that they had and their passion for the country and for, uh, you know, <laughs> whatever else you can call it. Most of these guys go back and enlist in the Navy and the, in the Royal Navy and fight in World War One. Many of them died in World War One at that time. Um, Shackleton, he was unable to. He was too sick after this. But uh, they all they all get medals, of course. Um, he winds up being knighted. But uh, it kind of goes back to the leadership thing of, you know, the one person that didn't get a medal was the engineer because he shot past the fact that he didn't trust him. And he, he held that against him, I mean, really for the rest of his life. And uh, kind of shows, you know, as we're talking about this, this is the best leadership story I can think of, you know, one of the best I've read, of course. Uh, but there, you, as we go through and we dive into it more, you see those flaws and you can really see uh, see the flaws there that are hidden behind all of the greatness of what he was able to do. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's a great point. I, I think, you know, the ideal situation and, you know, the Monday morning quarterback situation of that is he should have thanked that guy. Mm -hmm. That guy probably should have, should have gotten one of the, one of the more prestigious medals for being the naysayer and challenging Shackleton to look at the situation from a different point of view. Mm -hmm. And by having that, you know, the negative Nancy on the team, then Shackleton always had to have his ducks in a row and he always had to have an understanding of, okay, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but the, you know, here's, here's the outcome of the way I see this happening. And here's the second and third order effects of this happening. Mm -hmm. And here's the risk and there's the risk I'm willing to accept about going in this course of action, as opposed to doing what you're saying, which is say here and, and die. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's amazing. So uh, I think we can wrap it up on that. Uh, highly, rec highly recommend this book. Definitely. I haven't read South yet either, but uh, the endurance is amazing and I'm sure South is great too. And I think there's some movies out there. I'm not sure if they're any good though. 
Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, I'm sure there's there's a documentary. I know there's a documentary or two out there, and there it's it's an amazing story. At, at the very least, uh, go check out some of these pictures. Uh, I'm flipping through it right now. There's ones of them digging through the ice at multiple points. There's ones of them in the ship. There's ones of the ship after it's lifted up in the air. Um, there's pictures of the camps they set up. It's, it's really just amazing. Uh, it's kind of that great turn of the century moment where we're able to get all of these, you know, all these pictures of things that you wouldn't think you'd be able to. Um, Oh, one, one thing oh, we forgot to touch on, and I mentioned this at the beginning, uh, otherwise we could skip over it, was uh, the Age of Heroes. I kind of want to, mm-hmm. do you think you could dive in on that a little bit? Well, I mean, the Age of Heroes was, you know, the last great expeditions. You know, mm-hmm. it was, it was the, the first evers sort of things. And, you know, what were those, what were the things that were left to explore and find? You know, the Northwest Passage, uh, through the through the Arctic Ocean, the, right? Uh, you know, crossing the Antarctic, all those sort of things, and, and this this glory of wanting to be the first ever. Uh, and I think that's that's probably the simplest way of describing the Age of Heroes in that time, as as our society shifted from survival mode, if you will, where where you just did things to survive to the expedition and exploration mode of finding the next great adventure. Right. And uh, this is also, you know, the, the, uh, the age of heroes ends with world war one because uh, the, the way they put it is there after world war one, there were no heroes besides war heroes. And at that point, you know, it, yeah, what they did was amazing, but what they cared about more was that the, was their service for their country after this expedition. And, you know, it's the kind of sad, sad irony of uh, when you go through and you're reading about this is, yeah, they get some recognition for the amazing things they did. Yeah, there's books, but relative to what it is, you know, if they'd done this 10 years ago, completely different story. But because they left right as World War One was starting, you know, yeah, like, like uh, you know, like, like they were told, they they wanted them to accomplish this feat for British pride and to bring the country together. But like, oh my gosh, just tore the guys up and every single one of them. And they still, once they came back, the world had completely changed, I think. You know, you talk about there's periods of times where you get that very, uh, whether it's uh, catastrophic or technological or whatever it is, that rap- periods of rapid change, they were gone for one of those. Yeah, well, and, and when, you, when you analyze, not, and not to dive into World War I, but you analyze the culture of mm-hmm. the nations and and how it looked like and and really it's an interesting uh shift from the age of heroes because the age of heroes everybody worshiped these heroes and all these men who volunteered and went and fought in world war one that's what they were looking for was that kind of glory mm-hmm. when they went to you you look at the songs you look at the videos uh, you read about World War One, and that was the culture of the time. Was it, it wasn't just an attitude of, of service for your nation? It was it was more of a to be a hero for your nation. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's an interesting how the Age of Heroes ended with World War One. Is is that's why? I mean, that's my point of view of how mm-hmm. it ended. We went from went from worshiping these these great expeditions and explorers the first evers to like you said earlier the war heroes and and how everybody you know you could you could you could extrapolate that to today you know what do what do young kids young boys want to do they want to be great sports players and athletes those are the those are the i hate to use the word hero because they're not truly but those are the people we that you know we see on TV. They make millions of dollars, and and that that's the they got sim- the glory, the glory. Yeah, that's the glory. So that's a similar thing that that was going on, you know, at the turn of the 20th century, mm-hmm. is that that hero worship. And when World War One happened, all these young men saw that as an opportunity to become heroes, just like today, you know, kids playing football in high school see that see themselves. Yep, 90% of them at least see themselves as being a hero of a game 
either in high school, college, or the NFL, winning the Super Bowl, being in the Hall. Oh of yeah, Fame. Like, that's what they see. Like, I, I love to use this example because uh, I'm a big hockey fan, but I can't freaking skate. But I have scored more Game Seven overtime winning goals in my on our street in Colorado Springs than probably many people out there. Because <laughs> you're always you. Know, that's the point. You know, you always want that glory. You know, right. that's that's when you're growing up. That's what you're looking at. And you know, yeah. You, I mean, hell, we could do a whole episode on that, unpacking the the different mindsets that uh, drive people to do things like that. That could be interesting. Oh yeah, yeah. So, what'd you learn today, Cam? I did a lot of talking. Um, <laughs> here, let's start with you. What you got? Oh, and there I go. I learned I need a new router. Yes. yes. <laughs> Can I use that? I need a new router before next week's episode. Well, I learned. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say I, I truly learned it, but it, I got. I think I got a great uh, history refresher on the age of heroes. I'd forgotten about that time period, honestly, and how. That was some great point of how it transitioned out uh, with World War One and how World War One changed the entire world's mm-hmm. culture of how we we look at things. Uh, we look at life. We look at uh, patriotism. We look at who our heroes are. World War One was was that point mm-hmm. uh, when that changed. And you know, if I can retrace a little bit, I would say I. I uh, I learned what you were talking about with uh, for the culture of the countries in World War One and how, you know, for the British, especially how it was it was almost not glory seeking kind of, uh, I think, puts a little bit of a black mark over it. But the idea that, you know, wasn't a sense of the combined with a sense of servitude was the the desire to go make something of yourself, you know, whether you wanted to be, uh, you know, a war hero, when you want to be a hero for your town, that's what it was. And that was the opportunity that they saw. And I, th- I found that very interesting. Yeah, great. All right. Well, uh, man, this is another one that we can put up on the shelf and pull back down later because the, the story of uh, Shackleton and his men on the endurance is, is such an amazing uh, study of leadership style and, and teamwork and, and teams, teams working together to truly survive. And it, it's an amazing story. So, Hey, thanks for joining us today and I hope you have a, a great week and I hope some, you've learned a few points and lessons and how to be a better leader here.